Hi there. This is Eva Poehler. Um, I'm a USA Today bestselling author of over 30 novels in multiple genres, including mysteries, thrillers, and young adult paranormal romance. I'm thrilled to be here today and want to thank Madeline Dyer for inviting me and including me in this YA Thriller Con. I hope what I have to share with you today you will find useful. It's geared towards uh, writers of any kind of story, any genre, not just thrillers. Um, it's something that I have taught several times uh, at the university in creative writing classes. So hopefully you'll find it helpful. Um, let me go ahead and pull up my, um, my slideshow and you can follow along with me. And then at the end, there will be time for questions. And so let me just get this up really quickly and start from the beginning. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you today about the science of story. Story is something that's a creative process, but there, and you can't always control creativity. It's either coming or it's not coming, but there are some things that we can control. And those are the things that I'm gonna talk about today. So just to get us started, I wanna go over what is story. Um, Aristotle in Poetics in 350 BCE said that every tragedy falls into two parts, complication and unraveling. And then Aelius Donatus in the fourth century said a play is made up of three parts, protasis, epitasis, and catastrophe. Uh, Freytag came up with this very famous pyramid that we use to teach fiction where we have mo we have this inciting event or this moment that begins this rising action that creates a lot of tension and brings us up to the highest point known as the climax, after which there may be some falling action and a resolution. Svetin Todorov said that stories compri are comprised of narrative sequences. So they're very rarely, ex with the one act play, that triangle made sense. But when we tell longer stories, they're comprised of uh, more narrative sequences. These, these little, or they're like uh, the atoms of stories, okay? The, the smaller parts of stories. And so he describes them in a similar way where you start off with a situation that's relatively in a state of equilibrium. Something disrupts that equilibrium and creates this rising, rising, rising tension. Then there is this moment that he calls disequilibrium, this moment that's like a climax to that, that restores eventually that relative equilibrium. And then you're in this new equilibrium. And so in a story, then something else will disrupt it. And he talks about different ways that these narrative sequences can be combined. They can be linked in an episodic way so that you just have one following another. And a good example of a story that does that is William Golding's Lord of the Flies, where the story is just very episodic with one dramatic situation followed by another. But sometimes the stories can be uh, embedded so that you have a major narrative sequence that is broken up with a story within a story. So an example of that would be Willa Cather's The Professor's House, where you have the professor's story, but in the middle of that, he finds Tom Outland's journal. And so the story of Tom Outland is this story within a story that then has some kind of impact on the rest of the professor's story at the end. So you can have these narrative sequences where you have a story within a story. They can also be alternating. And this is particularly true of narratives that depend on alternating points of view. And one example is Tracy Chevalet's The Virgin Blue, where we alternate between the voice of this modern woman and an ancestor from the 1500s. And so what we have are these two different narrative sequences that are playing out, uh, going back and forth between them. So it, sometimes it's helpful for you to understand how you are combining these narrative sequences to try to create tension. You never want your story to be at a equilibrium without some kind of tension for very long. And here's a tip regarding scenes and chapters. 
start late and end early. That's a famous catchphrase for writers. Uh, sometimes we rewrite, and then what we need to do really is to delete the first couple of pages because it was helping us get into the story. The story really, the, the major tension where that inciting event or that complication occurs is often much later. And so if we can just get to that as soon as possible, and then when it comes to the falling action and the resolution, we don't want to go on too long afterwards. Once we return to a state of equilibrium, we should either end the story or have another inciting event come and cause some new tension. Start late and end early. Try to avoid a, a lot of uh, information dumps and tedious backstory. There's really useful ways that you can weave that in in the characters' dialogues and observations and, and just in the, the events rather than you as the narrator updating everybody on, on what they need to know to carry on. So it might be helpful to understand this distinction that narratologists make between story and plot. So according to E.M. Forrester in Aspects of the Novel written in 1927, story is just like a sequence of events. The king died and then the queen died. But plot, which is what you and I are in the business of, is more like an artful sequence of events. It has some kind of causality or, or meaningfulness. So an example might be the king died and then the queen died of grief. Now there's a connection between this sequence of events that we're describing. Uh, another way of describing story versus plot or another concept for helping us to understand the layers in story is to look at story and discourse. And this is uh, Seymour Chapman's distinction, story being this chronological sequence of events and discourse being that artful expression of events or the way we arrange the plot. And so Seymour Chapman, and, and this might I'm going to break this down with some examples. So this, I don't want to overwhelm you with this because this can be a little bit confusing. But if you think of story time as, you know, the world of your characters, uh, where it's taking place and what they're experiencing, and you think of discourse time as that layer where a narrator is, is talking about the story, and we look at the ratios between the time it takes for these things to happen, for the story to occur in the world of your characters and for the narrator to be able to tell about the story. If we look at the ratios of those times <clears throat> and we look at these different things like a scene, a summary, description, commentary, ellipsis, you can find out when it's more useful to use one over the other. So for an example, a scene, is when it takes about the same amount of time for a story to occur as it is for you to tell the story, okay? Whereas in a summary, there's very little uh, telling going on, very little discourse. It's just, a, a, you know, kind of like a lot of stuff happened and you tell it in just a very brief amount of time. And with description, the opposite is true. Uh, there's very little story going on, but a lot of description, a lot of telling, right? With commentary, there's no story time. It's just the narrator talking and making some kind of comment about, you know, how he or she feels about the story or the characters. So let me give you some examples to break that down. And you can see how all of these things are important to storytelling, but we might want to do more with one than another. So here's an example of a scene. And this is the one that I think that you should have the most of in your story, where the story time and the discourse time are relatively even. In other words, the, the time it takes for a character to experience something in a story is about the same amount of time it would take you to describe it to your readers. Jim sat alone in the park, wondering where he had gone wrong. The evening sun beat down on him, baking his cheeks, turning them redder than they'd been when Eleanor had left him. Had she not liked the restaurant? Had the waiter been rude to her? Maybe Jim hadn't looked at her often enough across the table as she relayed her little stories about her day. They'd been interesting enough. Or perhaps she should have told him, told more of his own stories. Maybe she'd mistaken his silence for lack of interest. A stray dog approached the bench, bringing Jim from his thoughts. The dog was thin, covered in sticker burrs and limping. Jim scratched the dog behind the ears. You're abandoned too. Are you, boy? 
So this is an example of a scene. Now, this is an example of a summary where the story time is much greater than the time it takes to tell it. Jim sat on a bench in the park wondering where he had gone wrong on his date until a dog approached him. So you can see the difference between the two. Sometimes it's important to do a summary like this if the information or what's happening at that time isn't really that important or isn't filled with tension or doesn't deserve to be spotlighted in your story. Sometimes we just need to do that to keep the story rolling. But as you can see, you want to rely more on the scenes than on summary. If your story is all summary, then your readers aren't going to be engaged. They're not going to be experiencing. It's just going to be a bunch of telling and not enough showing. Now, here's an example of a description. Seymour Chapman calls it a pause or an illuminated scene. And this is where the discourse time is greater than the story time. The story time, the story didn't take nearly as long to happen as it took to tell. Jim, a tall redhead in his mid-twenties with dark round eyes, sat alone on a park bench beneath the hot evening sun. The bench was worn and written on, Lovers had put their initials inside hand-drawn hearts. People of all ages, shapes, and sizes walked past on the trail, made of pea gravel and fallen leaves. Birds chirped from the tree branches overhead. But none of this mattered to Jim, who was red-cheeked and burning with humiliation, and most of all hurt that Eleanor had said no to a second date. Where had he gone wrong? Had she not liked the restaurant? Had the waiter been rude to her? Maybe Jim hadn't looked at her often enough across the table as she relayed her little stories about her day. They'd been interesting enough. Or perhaps he should have told more of his own stories. Maybe she'd mistaken his silence for lack of interest. A stray dog approached the bench, bringing Jim from his thoughts. The dog was short and long like a Dotson, but covered in curly hair like a poodle. He walked with a slight limp and was excessively thin, as if he hadn't eaten in days. There were sticker burrs matted in his fur, and one of his eyes was red and oozing pus. Jim scratched the dog behind the ears. You're abandoned too, are you, boy? Now, in this example, we got a lot more description. And sometimes that's important to a story. Sometimes you want to slow it down so that you can spotlight some really important things in the story. But sometimes it's cumbersome to readers to get all of these details. And they might be wondering, why are you telling me so much? Why is this significant um, that you're taking up my time to tell me about the sticker burrs and oozing pus on this dog? Is this dog going to be important to the story? Or are we just going to see this dog this one time and never again? Uh, if that's the case, then maybe don't spend so much time describing the dog. So it's a delicate balance that we have to play as narrators. And if we think of ourselves kind of like, Sometimes I think of myself as this uh, wait server, like in a restaurant, where I've always got to figure out how I can make my guest who's sitting at the table and I'm waiting on this person comfortable and happy. And if you think of yourself as this kind of service person and you're thinking about, I don't want to waste my reader's time. I want my reader's experience to be, you know, as enriched and fantastic as possible. Uh, think of yourself as a service provider like that. <clears throat> where can you cut out moments that you're wasting your reader's time, where you're just going on with details that really aren't important and kind of bog the story down? And you can edit those out. Now, I wouldn't recommend doing it on a first draft. Go ahead and write that first draft. But when you're in your editing process, you can look for details. Maybe there are areas where you haven't shown enough, where there's some kind of an explosion in the sky and you failed to describe it. Um, something important to the story. But there might be times when you've gone on too long about what a person is wearing and how their makeup appears and what kind of shoes they're wearing and on and on. And these tedious uh, uh, descriptions might be bogging things down. Now, here's an example of when story time equals zero. And this is what Seymour Chapman calls just commentary. Jim, who sat alone on a park bench after his date with Eleanor, was like many young men today. He thought he knew how to make a woman happy because he'd watched movies and read a few books. He thought he knew how to connect with women because he had a mother. But like so many other men, Jim had been fashioned by societal institutions to infuriate the very people whose admiration he sought. Okay, so here's an example of a narrator just sort of breaking that fourth wall and coming out and talking. 
And sometimes that's okay in a story. Sometimes that kind of commentary can be very entertaining if that's the kind of narrator you've set up. In that kind of story, the narrator is almost just as important as a character as the protagonist, right? Um, an example of this, I, I think of Edith Wharton's um, Roman Fever, where these two women, older women, go back to visit the Colosseum in Rome after uh, a place where they had um, spent some time together as young girls. And they go back years later and were told by the narrator of the story that each of the women looked at the other through the wrong end of her telescope. So that's an example of commentary where nothing's really happening. The narrator has stepped out to make this comment about her characters. And John Fowles does this in the, the French Lieutenant's Woman where he talks about uh, Charles, the protagonist of the story, thought himself a um, important paleontologist because he went around looking for sand dollars on the beach. Uh, you know, so he's making fun of his character. And I know the narrator in the prologue to, I think it's the Lord of the Flies, talks about how in this instant, uh, the game of golf and something else was invented simultaneously. I can't remember. These little comments, some can be funny and can be in entertaining and readers can enjoy them if that's the kind of story you're telling. But most of the time, that's not the kind of story we're telling. Most of the time, we are jumping up on our soapbox to make some kind of commentary that's not really important, relevant. Readers don't care. Uh, we're just bogging down and distracting from what's happening by stopping everything to say, hey, readers, by the way, notice this. This is what I think, you know, and, and so that can be detrimental. So we want to try to cut commentary out um, and leave um, and try to keep it mostly scenes. Now, here's an example of an ellipsis. And this is where discourse time equals zero. An hour after his date with Eleanor had ended, Jim returned to his apartment with a stray dog he found at the park. So notice here, we don't get any time sitting with Jim at the park, wondering what had gone wrong with his date with Eleanor. We don't see the dog approach him. We're just told that it happened. And now here we are an hour later back at his apartment. And sometimes an ellipsis is important because we don't want to show every single thing that's going on in the lives of our characters. We don't, you know, sometimes it's important to say two days later, Ellen and her friends found a dead body. We don't want to reveal over the course of these two days that Ellen took a shower, she brushed her teeth, she went to the bathroom, she uh, checked her bank balance. She, you know, we don't need to tell everything that happened in the life of Ellen. We only want to focus on those that are most relevant to the story, that are most full of tension. And so an ellipsis might be necessary. Two days later, three months later, two years later, because what happened in that time of the story wasn't interesting, right? And wasn't full of tension and suspense. So an ellipsis is an important thing to do when you need to skip, but it's a mistake to do this. This could be lazy writing if you're just not wanting to take the time to tell what happened to Jim when he was at the park, wondering what went wrong with his date. Um, we don't want to do this when the story needs to be told. Um, we don't want to do this when we're just being lazy and we're just trying to get to the end of our story. So you want to go through your draft and look for things like this where, okay, maybe I need to take this one sentence and turn it into a couple of pages because maybe what happened at the park is really crucial and my readers need to see and experience it for themselves. Or you might find a couple of pages where nothing really important happens. It's just people showering and putting on makeup and getting dressed and checking email. And not, you know what, maybe I need to skip this section and just say three hours later, okay? So that's another thing to look at. Um, and here's a tip. Revolve your story around important scenes and use summary and ellipsis to transition from one scene to the next. Try to find the right balance. You can't show everything. You don't want to show everything, but you also don't want to get stuck telling, 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 and not really showing what's crucial in your story. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the artful arrangement of events. <clears throat> 
David Leon Higdon in Time and English Fiction, written in 1977, breaks down these different types of orders. <clears throat> and this is very similar to what Svetin Todorov was doing with his narrative sequence, talking about how they could be chronological story within a story or alternating. And so what uh, Leon Higdon does, he talks about the beginning, the middle, and the end of a story and how they can be arranged that way chronologically, like we see in Pride and Prejudice, where the story and the telling of the story are chronological. Or what we might want to do is give away the ending, show the ending, and then go back and show our readers how we got there. And so an example of that is the Diary of Anne Frank, where we see the devastation of World War II and what happened to the Jews. And now we're going to go back and find out how did we get to this point? And then another way we can arrange our stories is what's called in medias rest, where we start in the middle of things. And then we go back and bring us to that. So we're not giving away the ending, but we're starting in the middle of a lot of tension and crazy chaos and then we're going back. So we've got our readers hooked with that chaos. Um, and so Lord of the Flies is an example of where we start. The boys are landing on this. They're all over the island and we're watching them come together. And, and just through pieces of dialogue, uh, we come to understand how they got there. And then there's the polytemporal. Uh, if you want to really go way out there and write a very fragmented a uh, story like uh, Slaughterhouse Five, where everything is just, it's like time travel. You're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and it's all very fragmented, but it's a great way to create tension. Okay, so here are some key aspects of artful arrangement and ways that we can create that, you know, all powerful tension that we need to keep our readers engaged foreshadowing. That can be a device where you hint at something to come, something ominous. Um, a puzzle or problem or mystery can be introduced in the beginning that really pulls that reader in. Um, the use of both external and internal conflict. So, so there can be a character who's like going through a problem, like maybe her house is haunted by ghosts, but she's also dealing with at the same time, a midlife crisis or the loss of a, a, a husband. Maybe she's a widow. Uh, a widow. Um, so there can be both these things going on at the same time. Um, dramatic irony is another way to create tension. And I use the examples of Othello and Oedipus, the king, but uh, maybe a more well-known example might be just the, the scary movie where the, the boogeyman is in the basement and there's some young girl who hears a noise and we know that it's the monster, but she's like, hmm, I wonder what that noise is. And without a phone, without a weapon, and sometimes without even very many clothes on, <laughs> the, the young girl goes downstairs into the basement and we're like, no, the monster is there. Okay, so that's something that you can create as a writer in your story, dramatic irony, where you've made it possible that your readers know about a trap. But the, the character, the protagonist is unaware. And so here's a tip, maintain tension throughout your story. Throw your characters in seemingly impossible situations and don't make it easy for them. Keep the stakes high. Just when things get bad, make them worse. Now, I just want to kind of go quickly over the different types of characters that a story might contain and, um, and kind of like shed some light on some of these terms that we use to describe them. So the protagonist is the main character in the story who is undergoing the major tension of the story. And sometimes there can be more than one protagonist. Sometimes an entire community can be a protagonist against some horrible force, but usually it's a single person. And the antagonist can be a person like a villain, but sometimes the antagonist can be that tornado or, you know, or even the character himself, his own uh, bad habit or um, struggle. Now, characters, we have primary, secondary, and background characters, and it's important for you to kind of understand which are your major characters, which are secondary, and which are just in the background. And the reason, one of the reasons why that's important is because you don't want to spend a lot of time, 
describing a background character that we're going to see one time. You're just bogging the reader down. Sometimes it's better to call on a, a, some kind of a stock character that we already are familiar with, uh, like a mad scientist. And this is what we see when Back to the Future, you know, we've seen Doc Holliday before. We know the kind of person. We don't need a lot of information to understand this kooky mad scientist. So um, now to rely on those kinds of stock characters a lot would be lazy writing. You don't want a story that's just filled with stock characters that you don't take the time to develop because you're relying on us to be familiar enough with them. So you do want to make sure that you don't fall into that trap. So pick and choose, you know, which characters are going to be those familiar tropey characters and which ones are going to be more unique and uh, multidimensional. And that brings me to the difference between round and flat. Round characters tend to be multidimensional. You get to see many sides of a character, whereas flat characters, you just maybe see them in one capacity, like the waitress that's serving us at the restaurant. We just know her as a waitress. We don't know that she's a single mother who has lost one of her children and, you know, blah, blah, blah. We don't know all that stuff. And if you were to spend a lot of time telling us all that stuff, but we just saw her in that one scene, that would be a mistake. So knowing which characters to develop and, and how, you know, dimensional to make them is something that just takes practice over time. Characters can also be dynamic or static. And your main, and this is not the same as round and flat. So a dynamic character is a character who undergoes significant change through the course of a story. Whereas a flat character, I, I mean, sorry, I just said they're not the same. And then I did that a static character stays the same. Sometimes it's important for a character to undergo change. We see this major shift, you know, and maybe they've learned some kind of lesson or overcome some horrible struggle, or maybe they've been defeated. It's, you know, their fall. Um, a, a static character is one who stays the same throughout the course of the story. And this can also be significant. Like in spite of all of these things, this character never compromised herself or, this character stayed pigheaded all the way through, you know. So, um, and I'll give you examples in just a moment. Um, and I've already talked about stock characters. Archetypes, now these are a little different from stock characters, uh, though not much. Archetypes are important, especially in genre writing. Um, readers, readers, this is kind of an interesting, uh, ironic thing in that Readers are always looking for something new to read, but they really want kind of the same things uh, often. They want to, when they pick up a book, they want to know, is this something that I'm going to like? Is this the kind of thing that I enjoy? And if there aren't enough tropes or archetypes that they're familiar with, um, they might be disappointed in the story. Uh, so our job as, as writers is to make the familiar strange. Um, and I'm not the one that coined that. And I'm trying, the name of the person who did say that is like on the tip of my tongue. And I can't, uh, uh, Henry, um, it's going to come to me at some point. But anyway, that's our job is to make the familiar strange. So we take something that people know and love and we just make it new for them and make it have a, some kind of a unique twist but there's still going to be something familiar there that readers can relate to and feel comfortable with. And archetypes are the way to, to do that. Now the term foils describes how characters are used to bring uh, different traits out in one another. And so just to kind of give you an example, often the main character is foiled by other characters in the story to show the main character as more honorable or more, uh, or more brave or uh, more determined, there will be a weaker character. Or maybe there will be a character who's very strong that shows the weakness of the main character. So these foils, they're not necessarily opposites, but there'll be something about one character that highlights or illuminates something in another. And this is often done in Westerns where the main character is always taller um, and faster with the gun, you know, faster on the draw than the sidekick. The sidekick is there primarily to foil the, the main character. And then the last thing on characters is motivation. It's really important that 
the thing driving your main character is um, accessible to your reader, that it's understandable, that it's realistic and believable. If I don't believe that your character would really do that, if I'm like, he wouldn't do that, then you're, you're failing as a writer. You want to make sure that things that your characters do are believable and the motivation is clear and realistic. Okay, let's talk just a little bit more about protagonists. Protagonists need to be relatable and flawed. Going back to that idea of the reader wanting to relate and be with something familiar, your you need to kind of like establish some kind of common ground so with your audience um, for that protagonist so that your reader doesn't feel, if your reader feels somehow disconnected, they won't feel invested in the story. Uh, and one way you can do that is to give your protagonist both external and internal conflicts. I talked about that earlier, where you have the character who's suddenly being haunted by a ghost. That's the external conflict. But she's also going through this like midlife crisis, and that could be the internal conflict. OK, I want to talk a little bit about point of view. Um, I have I remember when I was first writing, wrote a story from first person point of view and then wrote it all over again in third person point of view. And I think we, especially as young writers, we do that where we're not sure how I want to present this story to my readers. How do I decide on point of view? So hopefully some of the things that I say today will help you make that decision. And it will vary from story to story, depending on you know what it is you're trying to, to do with the story. So there's mainly two kinds of narrators. There's what we traditionally call the first person narrator or also known as a participant narrator. This <clears throat> narrator is a character in the story giving usually a first person account of what's going on. And most of the time that narrator is the main character of the story. Not always, can be an observer. Some people say in The Great Gatsby that Nick is not the main character of that story, that it's really Gatsby. And that even though Nick is the narrator, it's Gatsby's story. Other people argue, you know, it really is Nick's story. So anyway, it's kind of debatable. Now a non-participant narrator, traditionally called the third person narrator, is not a character in the story. This is a voice on the outside telling the story. And this voice uh, usually follows along one or more characters um, and tells a story kind of through their eyes, like we walk in the shoes of the characters. So let me just go in a little bit more detail about each. First of all, the participant narrator, like I said, traditionally referred to first person narrator, can be one of a few things. They may be a reliable narrator, which correctly relays the facts of the story. They could be an unreliable narrator, which incorrectly relays the facts so that you have to kind of read in between the lines. An example of this is uh, the yellow wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. This is told by a woman that we realize as we read the story is insane and that uh, we can't take what she says at face value. We have to read in between the lines to try to piece together what's really going on in that story. <clears throat> Now, a naive narrator knows the facts and relays them correctly, but misinterprets them. And an example of this uh, is the story Haircut, where this barber by the name of Whitey is giving our main character a haircut and is telling us about the good old boy in their town. And as he tells us about this good old boy, and he's like all pride, you know, full of pride and admiration talking about this character. We're appalled by what this good old boy has done. All the vandalism and, and bullying and violence. <clears throat> so there's this disconnect between the values of this naive narrator and our values and the values implicit to the story. Um, and, and, so that's another way you can tell a story is with a narrator that, yeah, gets the basic facts right, but there's this interpretation difference, this dissonance between, you know, what the what the narrator values and what we uh, and the implied author values. So I'm going to give you some examples. 
Um, but let me talk a little first about the non-participant narrator, um, traditionally referred to as third person. Now, this can be focused on a single character, what we call limited omniscience. Um, and another term that's often used is intimate third person. That's what I use when I write, is intimate third person, where I'm not speaking from that character's perspective, but I am following that character's perspective so closely. And to me, it helps me get the best of the benefits of first person and the benefits of third person, because I'm limiting the knowledge of that story to this one character and looking through her eyes, but I'm using my own voice as a narrator. Um, but that non-participant third person narrator might use multiple focalizers where they get into the you know, points of view of several different characters, what we call unlimited omniscience. And there's benefits to doing that too. And I'm gonna show you some examples in just a minute as to why you might choose to limit your perspective or show multiple perspectives in the story. And then another thing, um, the, 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 the narrator might be more covert, like a fly on the wall, using what's called a dramatic point of view. And Hemingway is really well known for this, where it almost like the story reads like a play with very few stage directions and descriptions of the setting. It's mostly dialogue. And then final point about the third person narrator, they may be more overt and editorial. And I mentioned uh, Tolkien and Wharton earlier, making all the commentary. That is an overt uh, narrator who almost becomes like a character in the story with their commentary. Um, and so th those are different ways that you can use the non-participant narrator. So the tip is to choose your narrator and focalizers. And by focalizers, I simply mean those characters whose, whose narrative perspective is sort of orienting the story for us and strategically, you know, make that decision. And I want to give you a couple of examples. And the first is uh, the telltale heart. And before, so before I go on with this, I'm going to show you, this is only going to take about 10 minutes, a telling of Poe's A Telltale Heart. And now this is, this kind of narrator is a participant narrator or first person narrator. And we're going to compare this narrator with one that uses the third person with multiple perspectives and see why one chose one and the other author chose the other. True, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous I had been, and then, but why will you say that I'm mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object there was none. Passion, there was none. But I love the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold, I had no desire. I, I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. One of his eyes resembled that of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. And whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so, by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now, this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. You should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. Every night about midnight, I had turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh so gently. And then when I made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed, so that no light shone out. And then I thrust in my head. He would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. <laughs> would a madman have been as wise as this? 
And then when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously. Oh, so cautiously, cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights, every night just at midnight. Uh, but I found the eye always closed. And so it was impossible to do the work, for he was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone, inquiring how he's passed the night. And so you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed, to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. To think that there I was, opening the door, little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me. For he moved on the bed suddenly, as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch, with a thick darkness, for the shutters were close fastened through fear of robbers. And so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing it on steadily, steadily. <laughs> I had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening and the old man sprang up in bed crying out, who's there? I kept quite still. I said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle and in the meantime I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed listening just as I have done night after night hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently I heard a slight groan. And I knew that it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief. Oh, no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt and pitied him, although I chuckled at heart. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been ever since growing in upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, it is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor. It is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. Yes, he has been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found all in vain. All in vain. Because death, in approaching him, had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard me, to feel my presence within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a single dim ray, like the threat of the spider, shot from out the crevice and fell upon the vulture eye. It was open. Wide, wide open. And I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct precisely upon the damn spot. And now, have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over acuteness of the senses? Now, I say, there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when a belt in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous. And so I am. And now, at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet for some minutes longer, I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart must burst. And now a new anxiety seized me. The sound be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. 
With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once, once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then sat upon the bed and smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It did not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If you still think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot, whatever. I had been too wary for that, a tub had caught all. <laughs> when I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. <laughs> I smiled. What had I to fear? I bade the gentleman welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man I mentioned was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I, I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while they answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things, but ere long I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached. I fancied a ringing in my ears, but still I sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct, and I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definiteness until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I now grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice, yet the sound increased, and what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound much such a sound as a watch makes when a belt in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about trifles in a high key with violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men, but the noise steadily increased. Oh God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore, I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting, and graced it upon the boards, but the noise arose over all, and continually increased. It grew louder, 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 and still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Oh, almighty God, no, no, they heard, they suspected, they knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought, and this I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now again, hark, louder, 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 louder. Villains, I shrieked, dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the planks. Here, here, it is the beating of his hideous heart. So that was Edgar Allan Poe. And um, you saw an example of the participant or first person narrator, also unreliable and mad. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about dialogue and then I'm gonna show you one other story that I'll read very quickly, it's very short, and then we'll have time for questions. But I just wanted to say a few things about dialogue. Um, you want to make sure that you don't use it unless you're using it to develop characters or advance the plot. So the tip is to avoid using dialogue as filler make these uh, discussions or conversations purposeful. Oh, and let me go back to um, showing you it in the slideshow mode. Here we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> 
So here's an example of the difference between using tags versus beats. Uh, tags are like Gertie said, you know, he asked, um, whereas beats are a description of action that either follows or precedes the dialogue. And so I recommend, and in my own storytelling, uh, use more beats because that way you can kind of cut down on the amount of she said, he said, they all said. So here's an example of a tag. I don't know, Gertie said. And here's an example of a beat. Gertie wiped her tears with the back of her hand. I don't know. An example of a tag. What do you expect? Gino asked. The beat. What do you expect? The corners of Gino's mouth twitched. So you can see the difference. It's much more effective to use beats when possible, but you know, you sometimes a line of action isn't um, isn't useful, or you've got too many actions going on. You know, it's a balancing act. Um, it's nice to use the beats because you don't just have these talking heads. He said, she said, he said, she said. Uh, the reader can visualize these characters doing things as they're speaking. Here's another dialogue tip, um, break up dialogue with action and interior monologue. So instead of giving us these big chunks of dialogue, break it up. So here's an example of, uh, of, a, of a student who wrote this. He, grab, he grabs my hands, placing them over his heart. This Rowan is telling me to keep you here, keep you safe. I need to see where this is going between us, Rowan. I can't deny my feelings for you or your attraction to me. I will do everything in my power to keep you and that little girl unharmed, but I need you here so I can do exactly that. Now, this is okay. This is fine. But uh, one thing is the use of Rowan over and over. You don't really need to do that. In fact, it can become distracting. So avoid having characters overuse the names of other characters in their dialogue. Um, but uh, what you could do is break it up and it makes it so much more interesting rather than this long monologue. He grabs my hands, placing them over his heart. I need to see where this is going between us. I lick my lips. I, I just listen. I swallow hard, unable to moisten my mouth. Sorry. I can't deny my feelings for you. He takes a shaky breath or your attraction to me. But I say, listen, I can feel his heart pounding. I will do everything in my power to keep you and that little girl safe. So it's more engaging when you can break up that those long chunks of dialogue. Now, I want to say a few words about diction and style. Diction can be simple or extravagant, casual, formal, common, common or elegant, straightforward or emotionally charged. Here's a tip. Use concrete language more than abstract to appeal to your reader's senses. Vocabulary is like your wardrobe. You use a small fraction of it, just like you don't wear all your clothes. You wear the ones that are comfortable. And that's what we do with language. So you want to make sure that <clears throat> after your first draft, you go back and try to find a way to vary your words and vary your sentence structure and try to find ways to eliminate a bunch of abstract language that or is just mostly commentary and try to bring in the concrete language that provides vivid, vivid sensory uh, experiences. Sentence structure can be short like Hemingway, long like Dickens. So as I mentioned, employ a variety of structures, vary your sentence openings. Beware of your own syntactical habits. Um, what I do is I focus on the verbs of a sentence, even in first draft writing. I try to find verbs that are very active and precise. And just to give you an example of what I mean by that, the verbs walked and looked, they aren't very precise. And so we usually have to use adverbs like walk slowly or walked quickly or looked uh, intently um, to help them because they're not precise and strong enough. So instead, try to find the more precise verb. Instead of walk slowly, you could say she crept or she waddled or she sauntered or she strolled, there's some other verb than walked that will probably do a better job. Not that you can't sometimes use walked, but you know, try to be as precise as possible. Same thing with look, maybe she gazed or she studied or she observed, um, you know, so, or glared, you know, there might be something more precise there. Uh, a few things about setting really quickly. It's more than just the, the time and place. The time can be a season like winter in the dead of night, you know, the place might be more than just, you know, the city and the, the state or the country, but also is it the country or is it the city? Is it a farmhouse or a posh penthouse, an alleyway, a dark forest? 
Other aspects might be the weather, the climate, the terrain, including mountains, bodies of water, vegetation, animals, other people. All these things can influence the atmosphere or the feeling that your story is evoking. So here's a tip. Use the setting to advance the plot, to reveal something about the character, or to create an atmosphere that causes tension. And so uh, really, really quickly, um, I wanted to show you an example of how setting is used in a story. And I may be running over um, a little bit on this, but I think that this is going to help you not only see the um, use of setting, but also point of view. Kate Chopin's story, The Char Charm, The Storm, sorry, is very short. It uses setting and also it uses an example of that point of view that is a uh, non-participant or uh, third person and uses multiple perspectives. I'm just gonna really, really quickly read this. The leaves were so still that even Bibi thought it was going to rain. Bobino, who was accustomed to converse on terms of perfect equality with his little son, called the child's attention to certain somber clouds that were rolling with sinister intention from the West, accompanied by a sullen, threatening roar. They were at Friedheimer's store and decided to remain there till the storm had passed. They sat within the door on two empty kegs. Bibi was four years old and looked very wise. Mom will be afraid, yes, he suggested with blinking eyes. She'll shut the house. Maybe she gets Sylvie helping her this evening. Bobino responded reassuringly. No, she ain't got Sylvie. Sylvie was helping her yesterday, piped Bibi. Bobino rose and going across the counter, purchased a can of shrimps, which Calixta was very fond. Then he returned to his perch on the keg and sat stolidly holding the can of shrimps while the storm burst. It shook the wooden store and seemed to be ripping great furrows in the distant field. Bibi laid his little hand on his father's knee and was not afraid. Calixta at home felt no uneasiness for their safety. She sat at a side window, sewing furiously on a sewing machine. She was greatly occupied and did not notice the approaching storm, but she felt very warm and often stopped to mop her face on which the perspiration gathered in beads. She unfastened her white sack at the throat. It began to grow dark and suddenly realizing the situation, she got up hurriedly and went about closing windows and doors. Out on the small front gallery, she had hung Bobino's Sunday clothes to dry and she hastened out to gather them before the rain fell. As she stepped outside, Alce Labore rode in at the gate. She had not seen him very often since her marriage and never alone. She stood there with Bobino's coat in her hands and the big raindrops began to fall. Alce rode his horse under the shelter of a side projection where the chickens had huddled and there were plows and a harrow piled up in the corner. May I come and wait on your gallery till the storm is over, Calixta? He asked. Come long in, Monsieur Alcy. His voice and her own startled her as if from a trance, and she seized Bobino's vest. Alcy, mounting to the porch, grabbed the trousers and snatched Bibi's braided jacket that was about to be carried away by a sudden gust of wind. He expressed an intention to remain outside, but it was soon apparent that he might as well have been out in the open. The water beat in upon the boards and driving sheets, and he went inside, closing the door after him. It was even necessary to put something beneath the door to keep the water out. My, what a rain. It's good two years since it rained like that, exclaimed Calixta as she rolled up a piece of bagging and Alcy helped her to thrust it beneath the crack. She was a little fuller of figure than five years before when she married, but she had lost nothing of her vivacity. Her blue eyes still retained their melting quality and her yellow hair disheveled by the wind and rain kinked more stubbornly now than ever about her ears and temples. The rain beat upon the low shingled roof with a force and clatter that threatened to break an entrance and deluge them there. They were in the dining room, the sitting room, the general utility room. Adjoining was her bedroom with Bibi's couch alongside her own. The door stood open and the room with its white monumental bed, its closed shutters looked dim and mysterious. Alcy flung himself into a rocker and Calixta nervously began to gather up from the floor the links of a cotton sheet, which she had been sewing. This keeps up. Do say the levee's going to stand it, she exclaimed. What have you got to do with the levees? I got enough to do. And there's Bobino with Bibi out in that storm if he ain't didn't left Friedheimer's. Let us hope, Calixta, that Bobino's got sense enough to come in out of a cyclone. She went and stood at the window with a greatly disturbed look on her face. She wiped the frame that was clouded with moisture. It was stiflingly hot. Alcy got up and joined her at the window, looking over her shoulder. The rain was coming down in sheets, obscuring the view of far-off cabins and enveloping the distant wood in a gray mist. The playing of the lightning was incessant. 
A bolt struck a tall chinaberry tree at the edge of the field. It filled all visible space with a blinding glare, and the crash seemed to invade the very boards they stood on. Calixta put her hands to her eyes, and with a cry, she staggered backward. Alcee's arm encircled her, and for an instant, he drew her close and spasmodically to him. Bont, she cried, releasing herself from his encircling arm and retreating from the window. The house will go next. If I only knew where Bibi was. She would not compose herself. She would not be seated. Alcee clasped her shoulders and looked into her face. The contact of her warm, palpitating body, when he had unthinkingly drawn her into his arms, had aroused all the old-time infatuation and desire for her flesh. Calixta, he said, don't be frightened. Nothing can happen. The house is too low to be struck with so many trees standing about. There, aren't you going to be quiet? Say, aren't you? He pushed her hair back from her face that was warm and steaming. Her lips were as red and moist as pomegranate seed. Her white neck and a glimpse of her full, firm bosom disturbed him powerfully. As she glanced up at him, the fear in her liquid blue eyes had given place to a drowsy gleam that unconsciously betrayed a sensuous desire. He looked down into her eyes and there was nothing for him to do but to gather her lips in a kiss. It reminded him of assumption. Do you remember an assumption, Calixta? He asked in a low voice broken by passion. Oh, she remembered, for in assumption he had kissed her and kissed and kissed her until his senses would well nigh fail, and to save her he would resort to a desperate flight. If she was not an immaculate dove in those days, she was still inviolate, a passionate creature whose very defenselessness had made her defense, against which this honor forbade him to prevail. Now, well, now her lips seemed in a manner free to be tasted, as well as her round white throat and her whiter breasts. They did not heed the crashing torrents, and the roar of the elements made her laugh as she lay in his arms. She was a revelation in that dim, mysterious chamber, as white as the couch she lay upon. Her firm, elastic flesh, that was knowing for the first time its birthright, was like a creamy lily that the sun invites to just contribute its breath and perfume to the undying life of the world. The generous abundance of her passion, without guile or trickery, was like a white flame which penetrated and found repose in the depths of his own sensuous nature that had never yet been reached. When he touched her breasts, they gave themselves up in a quivering ecstasy, inviting his lips. Her mouth was a fountain of delight, and when he possessed her, they seemed to swoon together <clears throat> at the very borderland of life's mystery. He stayed cushioned upon her breathless, dazed, innervated with his heart beating like a hammer upon her. With one hand, she clasped his head, her lips lightly touching his forehead. The other hand stroked with a soothing rhythm his muscular shoulders. The growl of the thunder was distant and passing. The rain beat softly upon the shingles, inviting them to drowsiness and sleep, but they dared not yield. The rain was over, and the sun was turning the glistening green world into a palace of gems. Calixta on the gallery watched Alcee right away. He turned and smiled at her with a beaming face, and she lifted her pretty chin in the air and laughed aloud. Bo Bobineau and Bibi, trudging home, stopped without at the cistern to make themselves presentable. My Bibi, what will your mama say? You ought to be ashamed. You ought to put on those good pants. Look at them and that mud on your collar. How you got that mud on your collar, Bibi? I never saw such a boy. Bibi was the picture of pathetic resignation. Bobino his, was the embodiment of serious solicitude as he strove to remove from his own person and his sons the signs of their tramp over heavy roads and through wet fields. He scraped the mud off Bibi's bare legs and feet with a stick and carefully removed all traces from his heavy brogans, then prepared for the worst, the meeting with an overscrupulous housewife. They entered cautiously at the back door. Calixta was preparing supper. She had set the table and was dripping coffee at the hearth. She sprang up as they came in. Oh, Bobino, you back my, but I was uneasy. Where you been during the rain? And Bibi, he ain't wet, he ain't hurt. She had clasped Bibi and was kissing him effusively. Bobino's explanations and apologies, which he had been composing all along the way, died on his lips as Calixta felt him to see if he were dry and seemed to express nothing but satisfaction at their safe return. I brought you some shrimps, Calixta, offered Bobino, hauling the can from his ample side pocket and laying it on the table. <gasps> shrimps! Oh, Bobino, you too good for anything! And she gave him a smacking kiss on the cheek that resounded. Cheval respond, we'll have a feast tonight! Oomph! Oomph! Bobino and Bibi began to relax and enjoy themselves, and when the three seated themselves at the table, they laughed much and so loud that anyone might have heard them as far as Laberlay's.
Alcee Laverlet wrote to his wife Clarice that night. It was a loving letter full of tender solicitude. He told her not to hurry back, but if she and the babies liked it at Biloxi to stay a month longer. He was getting on nicely, and though he missed them, he was willing to bear the separation a while longer, realizing that their health and pleasure were the first things to be considered. As for Clarice, she was charmed upon receiving her husband's letter. She and the babies were doing well. The society was agreeable. Many of her old friends and acquaintances were at the bay, and the first free breath since her marriage seemed to restore the pleasant liberty of her maiden days. Devoted as she was to her husband, her intimate conjugal life was something which she was more than willing to forego a while. So the storm passed and everyone was happy. So this was an example of a story told from multiple perspectives. And we just want to spend a moment kind of comparing the two um, and notice why Poe uses the participant or first person and Chopin uses the non-participant or third person. So Poe uses the limitations of the participant narrator because what's going on in the narrator's mind is more important than what is going on around him. We do not need to know the old man's perspective, only that his vulture eye is the object of the narrator's obsession. On the other hand, Chopin uses a non-participant narrator who focalizes the story through Bibi, Bobino, Calixta, Alci, and Clarice to drive home the point that everyone is happier and better off after the affair and the storm. So we can look at how Chopin's setting contributes to the story, how it adds to the tension and parallels the sexual tension in the story. Um, just as it's sudden, unexpected, and dangerous, so is the affair. Like the storm, the affair leaves everyone glistening like a palace of gems. We might not have gotten that had we not seen all the different perspectives in, in the story. You might have thought that the characters had remorse or regret or that they felt shame. But by seeing all the multiple perspectives, we can see that this was good for everyone. Um, now, we can also look at which story illustrates the dynamic character and which the static. Poe's character remains crazy from start to finish, a static character, whereas Chopin's main characters experience true sexual satisfaction for the first time, despite being married to other people, and as a result, are happier people. I wanted to just really quickly talk about theme and setting, but we're running out of time, so let me just summarize by saying that you don't need to be heavy-handed with themes and symbols, that these will occur naturally in your writing, leave them to the literary critics to discover them, and just really quickly wanted to go over these takeaways and then offer you an opportunity to ask questions. Create tension with external and internal conflict, mystery, foreshadowing, and or dramatic irony. Maintain tension by avoiding info dump. Start late and end early. Create important scenes tied together with summary and ellipsis. Artfully arrange the plot to maximize tension. Create relatable, flawed, and multidimensional protagonists. Throw your characters into seemingly impossible situations. Choose your voice and point of view strategically. Use more beats than tags and dialogue. Break up dialogue with action and interior monologue. Use strong verbs. Appeal to your reader's senses. Use the setting to advance the plot, develop character, or add to your story's meaning. Avoid being heavy-handed with symbols and themes. Also, write for a specific audience, for example, a literary or science fiction or romance. Don't try to please all readers or you will please no one. So that's it for the presentation. Do we still have time for questions or have I gone way over? Um, yeah, I'm afraid we haven't really got time because we've gone over a bit and we've got the next live session sort of in the queue ready to start now. I'm so sorry. No, it's, it's fine. Um, it was really informative and you've packed a lot of really useful information in. So yeah, thank you so much. So if anybody wants to contact me at eva at evapuller.com with questions, I'll be happy to answer them there. Great. Yeah. And if you've got any questions, you could always post them as a comment on the YouTube page and then we, I can make sure that Eva will get the questions. Oh, absolutely. I'll answer them there as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>